Hello, I'm Christopher Haney. I'm a doctoral student at the Department of Geosciences in South Florida. I'm going to be covering assessing palm decline in Florida using advanced remote sensing with machine learning technologies and algorithms. Here's a brief overview of what I'll be covering today. Uh, the stars indicate the areas where the ERDAS management suite was most beneficial in my thesis process. Here's a little bit of my background. Uh, I have some degrees in microbiology and geography. Started my PhD in the fall. I also did some remote sensing for the Army. And I'm starting up an NPO centric to genetic and geographic information. Here's a little bit about the sable palmetto. It's a Florida state tree. It has some of the highest ecological values, second and a third, when compared to 103, 134 other tree species. Uh, that's mainly due to its nesting materials, nest sites, and food provisions that it provides for the wildlife in Florida. It can be considered a keystone species uh, due to its predominance as being the most prolific palm tree within Florida. And here's the disease. It's called Texas Phoenix Palm Decline. It was discovered in 2008. It's a little bit different than lethal yellowing, um, which impacts mainly the coconut palms. The TPBDB impacts the wild type palms, which this is a pretty significant transition. Um, Hillsborough and Manatee counties are ground zero, or the epicenter for TPBDB, or the proposed. And I'll just show you a little bit what it looks like. So we have these this bronzing, leathery palm fronds. Uh, we have a normal, natural desiccating palm fronds and a healthy palm frond. And what happens is, is that the phytoplasms uh, plug off the nutrient flow uh, to the upper fronds and they start to die prematurely until the spear leaf dies. Right here. Now this is an electron micrograph of the bacteria as it's, it's plugging off those chambers of nutrients to the top of the tree. There's currently no cure for it and it is terminal. It's known to be in 22 counties as of 2016. I'm sure this has spread quite a bit since then, and it has been detected in Texas and Louisiana. There's currently no protected status for the sable palm. It's kind of esoteric understanding of what's going on with TPBDB, and I'd like to spread some awareness about it. It also makes it difficult to get funding for improved treatment strategies, as its current status is secure. Here's just uh, some of my objectives while I was going through my thesis process. Uh, and some of the gaps in the literature that I found that I thought I could expand on. All right, so the study area is 500 hectare acre parcel located within Hillsborough County. And I'd like to note that it's kind of the canary in the coal mine uh, as Hillsborough County is expected to see the most dramatic impacts from TPBDB uh, due to the persistence of the disease within the area. I got three images from the Digital Globe Foundation program, uh, 2010, 15, and 17. I'd like to note that, just take a look at these off nadir degree angles. Uh, typically, in any change detection, you want to have uh, very good nadir, like almost straight on top image angles. But uh, when referencing the historical archives, uh, sometimes you don't get the luxury of doing that. So I'll show you some of my mitigation strategies on how to handle these off degree angles. There was also a LiDAR collection in 2007, um, which was fantastic in aiding my process of truncating the data set to pre-infection time frame. So I could isolate the canopy and just the palm trees to a discrete data set before TPVDB was impacting the palms. Um, I did go out to the field, uh, collected some field spectra. This is an infected palm. This is a healthy palm. And I used sand and water to empirically calibrate my image. Okay, so here's my workflow. I'm not going to be able to cover all of this, but if you want more details, I'll have my contact information at the end. Um, I can send you my whole thesis if you want to read it, uh, but we're just going to go over the high points here. So one of my first processes was to convert my point cloud data into a raster. So I used a, a DEM and DSM using the U.S. Geological Survey Naming Convention. This is the bare earth, and this is all the top of feature returns. And I subtracted those two to get a feature layer, which I use as a binary raster later and helping to isolate the canopy. So dealing with those off-nader angles, uh, 
the Erdas Imagine photogrammetry suite was fantastic in collecting up all of my layers and and managing my ground control points in a three-dimensional fashion, X, Y, and Z, um, to where I could derive a, a sub, you know, 0.5 uh, worldview 2 image uh, root mean square error. And that, that really brought the images back into alignment and reduced the amount of error uh, for canopy overlap for the NDVI calculations. This was very paramount uh, that I get uh, uh, increased accuracy for the success of, of the research project. I also read in some literature that uh, gray level co-occurrence matrix layers are uh, fantastic in increasing your accuracy. So I added five layers based off of the seven and eight, so ten layers total. Uh, and then here's the uh, spatial modeler I use. It's a pretty extensive uh, process. It took me a while to develop this. Uh, and I would just like to say this was fantastic in organizing all of my files. When I run this whole process, it produces about 500 gigabytes of information. So trying to track down where all those intermediate files would have been not feasible for my application. And I could also truncate or expand my research area based off of one connector. So if I wanted to do some experimentation with stepwise refinement, uh, that came in quite handy during my process. Now for the canopy isolation, I used the NDVI vegetation baseline mask coupled with an elevation mass from the DEM and DSM subtraction. I only used areas that were like one or two meters off of the ground and vegetation 0.4 above on the NDVI scale. And when those were coupled together, I could get my final mask. And I'll show you my canopy mask. So right here you'll notice there's two structures that are shown on the image and there's a lot of low-lying green scrub. So in order to isolate the low-lying green scrub, I use the one or two meters above feature height. And then the NDVI would not capture any of the, the, the actual structures. <clears throat> so when joined together, it was a really good canopy isolation. My next process was to segment them. I wanted to get a horizontal segmentation process based off of the illumination sun angle. And then my next step was to create um, spectral indices for zonal statistics. And I used this in R to classify my palm. So this is a bedrock for providing those inputs to the machine learning process. There's a lot of conflicting information regarding um, which zonal statistics were most significant. So I ran pretty much every zonal statistic I could run. Which resulted in 175 statistics for each feature. Um, I did remove some because of a low order of data, and I did not want to get any height bias based off of the maturity of the trees uh, with a, a mean feature height. So the data set, uh, just to mention, was parsed into this data set, this table, with all the zonal statistics was parsed into three different ranges based off of illumination. Uh, this helps take the load off of the the machine learning process for shade, sunshade, and, and shadow. This was demonstrated in, in several different studies in my thesis. Um, and then I classified them independently with three different classes, coniferous, deciduous, and palm. And here are my errors. These are my top performers. So if you don't want to run 175 statistics, you can run 10, 15, or 20, um, based off of the average of the, the illumination ranges. This is the, the heart of my study. It's a... Uh, the bridge that I built with TensorFlow and Kira as an R for remote sensing data. There's a lot of stepwise refinement here and adjusting all these hyperparameters, but you get 175 input statistics and you get three different classifications as the output. Um, there's a lot of permeability here um, and there's a lot of, of room to move around, but this is the best thing that I came up with and it's not trying to scale. There's about 2 million parameters for this. And here are my classification results. On the top, you can see TensorFlow, and on the bottom, you can see Random Forest. I can, after, I will just want to go back here. So I did train both data sets on 2,700 samples. So this is a palm tree, conifers, the tree, deciduous tree. Um, and then I took a separate 500 samples based off of just the palm classification and converted that into a binary system. Uh, and then evaluated them. 
and you can see that TensorFlow was significantly more accurate than Random Forest. Random Forest is kind of the mainstay. It's an excellent benchmark for testing new classification mechanisms. My next process was to take the other two temporal data frames, worldview imagery frames, and calculate uh, NDVI changes based off of that. I had to calibrate some of the precipitation factors within that. I'm not going to get too much into that, but uh, once those those chime time stat changes were calculated, they were applied just to the palm polygons. I also ran into some issues with uh, anthropocentric disturbances at the site. There's a fire here, and it wasn't enough time for the palms to rejuvenate naturally, so I isolated that with a coarser segmentation process and marked those areas as no data. Just too unstable for the NDVI, and I deleted that from my data set. So once we have the anthropocentric disturbances isolated, I thought it would be a good idea to provide an overview map uh, to forestry managers or ecological managers on where palm decline in general is happening. Uh, and I had to fit that map based off of ground truth points. So I can see a palm on time one here is declining, time two, you know, we've got another palm here declining. This is Google Earth imagery. Uh, and all of these palms represent a blue dot on this map. And that's what I use to calibri calibrate the, the rasters, the DN numbers, into different bins. So you know, high, medium, or low, or susceptible areas. And you can see there's a natural incline to that. Note that I also have the discrete polygons for each of the palms that are classified that has the same data. It's just not visually representative uh, at this scale. So this is a good large scale like cluster generalized area and if you want to get more granular results you can have the discrete polygons with this NDVI change information associated with it. And just show you one out to the field and you can see those bronzing crispy leaves that are indicative to TPVDB within the location and that corresponds to this location right here. It's very red and there's a lot of decline action within that area. My final results uh, this was taken off of those discrete palm polygons, uh, not the empirical Bayesian Krieging map. And you can see there's a significant uh, area um, that is declining and is not improving. Um, and, and so I parse this into susceptible and decline areas. I just want to note that I cannot directly draw a connection between TPVDB and the decline that I've seen until we can get our core trunk samples processed with a PCR um, polymer chain reaction processing that will fingerprint the DNA. It has to be definitive even though the uh, the appearance is very indicative to Texas Phoenix palm decline. Uh, just moving forward, yeah, we are collecting core samples. Um, we're talking to the uh, Florida Native Plant Societies for grants to process our trunks. Um, and NVIDIA just gave me a grant to expand my research area. So here's the the study area that I did. But this is the entire data frame of imagery that I have. And the, uh, the anthropocentric mas masking and the, uh, the canopy isolation works fantastic in urban zones as well. I also like to say too is that this process right here can be used for several different applications. I mean it, does, it just doesn't have to be palm trees. This can be used for classifying pretty much anything on a, on an Im image, a uh, multi-spectral image. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, you can contact me at gengeo.org. That's G-E-N-G-E-O dot org. All these palm trees are in my front yard. That's kind of what has drawn me to this, and that's why I'm interested in this, and why I want to find a cure for this disease. We know the why and the where, it's just the how. How are we going to get this? That's the next part that I want to work on. Thank you for listening, and I would like to thank Hexagon uh, for having me out there and speaking at their conference. Thank you very much.